I'm going to introduce myself since Liz is over there, but um, I'm a graduate student in the plant breeding program. I work with sorghum in the Steve Kresovich lab. Um, I'm starting hopefully my last year. And I have some experience uh, before coming to Cornell doing some field work uh, with sorghum, just traditional breeding in my country. I am from Argentina. And I guess that's why Bernard invited me to tell you a little bit about sorghum. To, um, we're going to have classes talking about maize and about rice. So when I plan to organize the class today, I thought you would probably be interested in having some information about how to structure a breeding program for sorghum, which is a self-pollinating crop, but uh, I'm going to talk about a program targeted to produce hybrids. So that represents some challenges with the self-pollinating crop, and it will make the program different from other hybrid producing crops, such as maize, that you're going to hear about from Margaret, and also different from other self-pollinating crops, such as wheat, for example, which the ob objective is really to produce cultivars or varieties. So. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the crop itself, you know, the species, the flower, and that kind of thing, which is necessary to know um, to organize the program. But I'm going to try to focus on the parts of the program and also the different type of crosses that you're going to do with a crop like this. Sorry for my voice, but <laughs> I woke up like this this morning. So please uh, stop me and ask me questions at any point in time. Okay. So, um, just a brief introduction about the crop. Um, it is believed to be domesticated, to have been domesticated in Ethiopia, and then it moved from there to West Africa, and also from the east of Africa to India. Uh, hybrids were introduced in the U.S. in the 1950s. And uh, this is just a graph to show you how fast the hybrid sorghums were adopted in the U.S. You know, this, is, this represents corn that, of course, didn't have the limitation of needing a sterility system uh, to produce hybrids. But so the reason why this was so delayed for sorghum is until this, the sterility system was found and then the hybrids uh, were rapidly adopted. Now, I want to uh, stress that Mostly of what I'm going to talk about how sorghum hybrids are really applicable to temperate climates because in most developing countries in Afri Africa and India, they still produce land races and open pollinated varieties. Okay? But in most other temperate climate countries, they do commercialize and produce hybrids. It is the fifth most important crop in terms of production, in terms of money in the world. It is a relatively small genome size, and uh, that's an advantage, 700, around 700 megabases. It has a diploid number of chromosomes of 20, and the major producers are USA. In terms of volume, <coughs> USA, the India, some countries in Africa like Nigeria and Sudan, Mexico, my country, and China. But 
in countries like USA, Mexico, and my, my country, and China, sorghum is mainly produced to feed livestock. But in most countries in Africa and India, it is used for human consumption. So more than 55% of the production is for human consumption, so that the objectives and the goals in a breeding, breeding program like that are different than in a program for livestock feeding. As I say, it is mostly a self-pollinated crop, but it has some level of outcrossing, which also means it is a little bit more complicated because you cannot trust that the, the panicles are going to be self completely. So you need to bag your panicles in the breeding program. The level of outcrossing varies. Some materials have higher, up to 35%, and some are very rarely outcrossed. The main characteristic is, is, is that sorghum is a crop very adapted to drought conditions and high temperature conditions. So it is able to survive with less than 400 millimeters of rainfall where, in places where maize cannot be produced. And that's why it is very important for human consumption in, doubt, in those very drought areas. It is a short day plant. And that means uh, that it will flower when the, the length of the day goes below 12 hours. But that represents a problem in a temperate climate. So how many of you have seen a sorghum plant or have been in a sorghum field? How many? Uh, raise your hands high. Oh, OK, quite a few. So why do you think that being a short day plant, if that is not modified, is a problem in a temperate climate? Why do you think that is? Right, when the days are short enough to flower, the, temper the temperatures are really low. So you have a problem there, where in tropical uh, places, the, the, short, the, day of, the length of the day goes down, but the, temper the temperature is high all year round, right? So you don't have that problem. So for the materials that are normally short day plants to be adapted to temperate climates, they have to go through what is called a sorghum conversion program, that is, um, organized by the USDA together with the Texas Agricultural Experiment Station System. And what this program does is that it takes the, the exotic materials or the materials that are short day and adapt them to temperate conditions. And they basically do several things. That program is still working in Puerto Rico and Texas. Uh, it's struggling a little bit now, but um, they basically introduce two sets of genes. One set is the, for the photo period to make the plants insensitive to the photo period, which means that they're going to flower independent of the day length. Okay? And they do that by introducing a set of uh, those six genes, and there are actually more now. And what they also want to do is reduce the height. A normal tropical sorghum is several meters tall. And that is important for places like in Africa where people use the stem and the leaves for other things. But if you are thinking about grain sorghum producer that are going to harvest with a combine, that's not good. So you need to reduce your height unless you are looking for a forage sorghum. And a forage sorghum is usually tall. So if you are targeted grain sorghums, they introduce those dwarf genes, which make the plants shorter. In some cases, in what they do also in the program is they evaluate some of the values of the lines. For example, they test for resistance to some diseases uh, or to some pests. And sometimes they do test for the fertility reaction. And I'm going to talk about this a lot afterwards. Um, but it's very important in sorghum when you're working with some lines to know whether it's going to be sterile or it can restore fertility. So for doing that, you need to do a set of crosses and tests for the fertility reaction. And sometimes that is done in the conversion program. So um, how do you breed for a hybrid with a self-pollinating crop? So we need to talk about the flower a little bit. Um, this is a diagram showing you how the sorghum flower looks like. And, uh, I was interested in knowing how many of you have seen a sorghum plant because the actual flower is really tiny. So in a flower like this, where you have the, the anthers, which are three in sorghum, together with the female parts, and it is a bifidus stigma, to avoid self-pollination is really hard. 
If you want to do it by hand, what you have to do is you need to open the flower, separate the glooms, and remove the anthers without destroying the female parts and without shedding pollen to be able then to bring pollen and cross. That is extremely difficult and it's very laborious. So to really produce hybrids, you need some system of sterility. Now there are basically two systems of sterility. There's what is called the cytoplasmic male sterility or the genetic uh, sterility system. Of course they are both genetic in the sense that they are determined by genes, right? But uh, what's the main difference between those two? I understand you've been, you've seen this before in the class. So what's the difference between, the, between a CMS system and a pure genetic system? Just broadly, what's the main, like the first thing that pops up of your mind when you say CMS? What causes the sterility in a CMS system? Right, it's really the, the incompatibility between the genes in the cytoplasm, which are in the mitochondria and chloroplast, and the genes in the nucleus. There is an incompatibility there, so it is sterile. Whereas in the genetic sterility system, it's just that you have some genes in the nucleus that causes sterility, okay? So CMS is, is important to know that because that will determine the way you make crosses. How is the cytoplasm inherited? Does it come from the female or the male? Sorry? Female. Female, right. So you have to be careful about the way to make crosses. If you want to keep a cytoplasm, you have to be very sure which line you're going to use as the female because that's the one that is going to transmit the cytoplasm. So how is the CMS work in sorghum? The system was discovered when a, when a cross by uh, using a Milo by a kefir was produced. Those materials are different races. Milo is from the Dura race. And when they cross those lines, they realize that they obtain a sterile line. So they discover there is an incompatibility when the cytoplasm from Milo is used with a set of nuclear genes from kefir. But the problem was that once you have your CMS, you need to discover the way to recover fertility, right? Otherwise, you cannot make a hybrid. And so there's another set of genes called RF, which means res fertility restorer genes, that come from another group of plants that are necessary to restore the CMS later. I'm going to explain that when I describe the program. So this is very important because in sorghum, the program is going to be structured according to the reproductive groups, which means whether or not the lines can be sterilized. Okay? If they can be sterilized, and they're going to have the CMS, they're going to be included in the female side of the program. If they have the RF set of genes, so if they can restore fertility, they're going to be considered males, and they're going to be included only in the male part of the program. There are several different types of CMS in sorghum. Um, I just listed some of them, but there are actually more. But I would say that probably 80% of the commercial sorghum today uses the A1 system. Some of them use the A2 commercially, but usually the other systems are only used experimentally by the breeder. The reason for that is because there are not many lines that are able to restore in those cytoplasms, and that's why they are not very useful. Please ask me questions if you feel I'm going too fast or you need more explanation. Okay. So I'm going to describe how the CMS system works, but um, just keep in mind that what I'm going to describe in this slide is usually already done in a breeding program. You don't need to do that. But this is the way the cytoplasm um, was introduced. So you basically have your two lines, your Milo, which is fertile. The cytoplasm of the Milo is the yellow. That's what represents and the set of genes that the Milo have in the nucleus are called dominant MSC, which means that the Milo with its own cytoplasm is fertile. But the kefir is fertile with its own cytoplasm, which is color orange. The problem is when you cross them. 
So when you cross them, but using the Milo as the female, remember, so you keep the Milo cytoplasm. So you bring pollen from the kefir into the Milo. What happens with the F1 is that it's going to be fertile, even though it has the cytoplasm from the Milo. The reason is because the set of nuclear genes are heterozygous. So you still have a dominant allele coming from the Milo, which makes the F1 fertile. OK? Is that clear? OK. The problem comes when you self that F1 and you go into the F2, then you have segregation. OK? And what's going to happen is all of them will have the myelocytoplasm. But just the one that is homozygous recessive for the genes from kefir is going to be sterile. OK? All the others are going to be fertile. And this is the line that you're going to be interested in using in your breeding program as the source of your cytoplasm. So what people have done is they have uh, developed a backcrossing system to use this line and bring pollen from the cave here several times so that you recover almost 100% of the cave here in the nucleus but with the cytoplasm of the Milo. And that is a stated line. That line is going to be called, in a normal sorghum breeding program, the A line. A means that it's a sterile. So this, this is very important in every program. It's going to be your source of sterility. So we're going to talk about the program considering that you already have this, OK? Everything else has been done. How does a CMS system look like? Um, well, I tried to show you, this picture is, might not be very good, but these pairs of panicles represent exactly the same line, exactly the same genotype, except that the A is sterile and the B is fertile. So if you look at the anthers over there, the fertile one has normal anthers. They are large, they are usually strongly yellow color or orange, and of course they shed pollen. Whereas the A line also produce the anthers, but usually they don't produce pollen. The anthers are thin, they are smaller, and even in some cases where the pollen is produced, the pollen is not viable. But that needs to be tested, of course. So what are the components of the program? Um, as I said, the program is divided into two subgroups. And it, it is like you are working with actually two programs separately, and you don't mix them, never, ever. The reason being because you don't want to mix the fertility reaction. So you want to keep the female line separated and the male lines uh, in the other sub-program. So the female part of the program is going to be where your female lines or your stereo lines are going to be. So for every genotype, you're actually going to have always two rows. One is going to be sterile, and it's going to be the A version of your line. And the other one is going to be your fertile line, which is called the B. So the way to maintain the A is that you're going to bring pollen from the B to the A every year, and then the A is going to be sterile again next year. The way to maintain the B is just you self it. You put a paper bag, and you self the panicle, and then you maintain it. And that line is going to be fertile. While in your male part of the program, which are also called restorers because they restore fertility, you just do selfing. It's a much easier uh, type of program. You don't, need, um, you don't need to do anything else. And you don't cross these materials until the very end when you want to test the reaction of those lines in a hybrid combination. That's the only point where you cross them. Is it clear up to now? OK. So now I'm going to talk about each program separately so that um, you can see what you do with, with each sub-program. We're going to start with the female side. So as you probably know, in every program you need to create new populations every year. You need to make crosses. And what you usually do is you cross your best lines with your best lines or maybe you cross your best lines with lines that have some characteristic that you like, some resistant to diseases, some quality traits. 
So every year you do a lot of crosses. But you always cross B by B. Okay, you never introduce males here. When you cross a B by B, remember they are both fertile. So you need to do it manually. And that's very laborious. And um, just to give you an idea of the numbers, um, a medium sized breeding program will probably do per year around between 200 and 500 of these type of crosses, just only for the females. And for each cross, you really cross multiple panicles, not only one. So it's, it, it, ta it takes a lot of time. Then you obtain an F1, and you self it again, you go to the F2, and that's where you have segregation, and that's where the breeder usually applies selection. And that really varies depending on the population. If it's really good, it will probably keep a lot of panicles from that population. If it's not that good, just a few. And then from now on, you maintain those lines uh, with some selfing system. It could be a pedigree method, it could be a single seed descent, and you're going to maintain them selfing every year with a paperback. Until the line is what is called stable. And that's kind of um, difficult to define what is stable because some breeders consider that an F4 is stable enough to start to sterilize the line. Some breeders start at F3, um, maybe late, yes. So when you do this, do this selection, do you just self the significant ones? Yes. So every time, so you have an F1, which is basically going to be every plant that you the put is going to be exactly the same, right? So there's nothing you can select there. But then when you sell them, you go to the F2, you have several rows of the same population, but every plant is going to be different. So you select from there, and every panicle, you keep it separated, and next year you plant a row coming from that panicle. Okay? Okay. So um, when the line is stable, uh, which usually is F4, sometimes F3. Of course, you can continue selfing them, but that takes a, long, a lot of generations if you want to do that before sterilizing the line. So the breeder wants to do it as soon as possible to save time. So let's say in F4, you decide to start sterilizing the line. So you go and you take the pollen from that F4 line and you bring it to your CMS source, okay? That line that is sterile in your program that is gonna be the source of your cytoplasm. So you have an F1. How is the F1 going to be, fertile or sterile? You bring the pollen from the B into the A. How is the F1 going to be, sterile or fertile? Sterile, sterile exactly. So from then on, you start a back crossing system. Every year, you bring pollen from your B to the A, and you start sterilizing it. You do that for several generations, because what you want to do with the back cross is recover the genotype of the B, but with a sterile cytoplasm. So that, again, is variable depending on the breeder, but some breeders decide that this back cross three or four is good enough to start testing the line in hybrid combinations. So even though you continue the back crossing system, you start crossing those sterile lines to males to see how they perform in a hybrid combination. And that's what I call here G, C, A, and S, C, A. You know what general combining ability and specific combining ability is, right? So you need to know the value of the line for your general and specific combining ability to decide whether you want to keep it in the program or you want to discard it. So as you see, in the female side of the program, you have a lot of steps. You have to create the population. You have to self it for several generations. Then you have to sterilize it for several generations before you even know the value of the line. And most of the lines are going to be discarded, really. So in the male side of the program, it's something very similar, but of course simpler, because you don't need to sterilize the males. So what you do again is every year you make a lot of crosses of your best R lines with your best R lines. You obtain an F1. 
Then you self fit. You go to the F2. And there you have your segregation. And you go, you select the best lines that you want. And you continue selfing those for several generations until you decide they are stable enough to again cross them with females to determine the general or specific combining ability of the line. Yes? The ones that we talked before from this part of the program. Okay? If the lines are new, uh, if your R lines are new, you usually cross them with A lines that are not new, that are all lines in your program that you already know how they perform. You first cross them with those. Then if the male line is good enough, you're going to cross them with your best new lines. OK? I'll tell you a little bit about that later. OK. So what are some of the differences with um, other outcrossing species? For example, maize. Uh, with maize, you're also going to produce hybrids, but usually you see a lot of inbreeding depression in maize. Meaning that when you sell the lines, you start seeing problems because homozygous recessive uh, or deleterious alleles come, to, come together and then the line starts to perform worse when you inbreed it. But in sorghum, you don't see that. And you don't see that because it is normally a self-pollinating crop. So it doesn't have such a big mutation load, what it's called. So when you sell it, the lines perform perfectly well. So that's an advantage compared to a crop like maize. Another difference is that the program in sorghum is not divided according to heterotic groups, which is some, something you're going to hear about from Margaret Smith. Uh, what you use is you divide your materials into reproductive groups, which is what we talk about, your females and your males. In, in some way, you're actually creating heterotic groups because you don't cross your males with your females. So when you finally cross them to produce a hybrid, you're going to have a lot of hybrid vigor. You are really creating heterotic groups. But the main reason why you separate them is because of the reproduction uh, response. In a program like sorghum, you do a lot more work with the females than with the males, much more. And the crossing of your B by B and your R by R is very laborious, much more than with maize. So how do you actually make the crosses? And I like to talk a little bit about this because every cross has a different type of system. Let's start with you cross your B by B and your R by R. So remember, those lines are fertile. And here I, I have a picture that, it, of course, this is, um, has been amplified, really. But these are the parts of the flower in sorghum dissected. So everything here is enclosed by these two glooms. So if you, again, if you need to do that by hand, you need to remove these three anthers. Don't destroy the stigma and the ovary. And don't contaminate with pollen from here into there when you use a forceps or something. That is extremely difficult. Because if you look at a panicle like this, you know, all of that is just a tiny flower here. So I've seen a very, very few sorghum breeders actually do this by hand routinely because it's very time consuming. It can be done, but for large numbers, it's difficult. So one of the methods they have developed for doing this uh, in a larger scale is what is called the plastic bag method. It works really well. And what it, the way it works is when you have a panicle of sorghum like this, I'm not sure you can see the difference, but it has flower up to here. Do you see, see there's like a yellow type of color up? That, those are the anthers coming out of the flower. So that part of the panicle has already flower. So the way it works is you wait for the top part of the panicle to flower, you come and cut it, everything up to the, way, the level it has flowered, and then you put a plastic bag on the rest of the panicle, and on top of that, a paper bag. And you leave it there for around two days. What it's going to cause is the heat and the humidity inside the plastic bag is going to raise. And so it's going to create a very humid and hot atmosphere 
And the anthers, when they come out, they won't shed pollen because they are completely rotten, like destroyed. And so two days later, you come, take the plastic bag, and when you shake the panicle, the anthers will fall off, but with no pollen released. The panicle is completely wet at that point in time, so you cannot pollinate a wet panicle. It's not going to work. So you leave it for a few hours to dry, and then you bring the pollen from the plant that you want to cross and pollinate the panicle, and then close it again with the paper bag. That's the way it's usually done. Uh, for a panicle like this, it's considered that it flowers in six to seven days, and usually flowers two centimeters per day. So if you wait two days, you will usually have this, this much of uh, flowers and this much of grain. The rest you're going to discard. It's going to be empty. Now, this method is not perfect, which means that you are going to have some level of selfing. The only way to know that is when you go to the next generations. So you plan the next year. Sometimes you can detect selfing in the F1 if the two parents of the cross are very different and your F1 is exactly as the female, then you know you have some selfing. But sometimes it's difficult to know. So you even have to go to the F2 and see if there is segregation. If there's no segregation, which means every panicle it looks the same, it means you have a selfing here. Okay? So even though this method is not perfect, it will allow you to do hundreds of crosses. And uh, it is done with a considerable success. There's another method called the hot water system. It's, it is a little bit more complicated, but I would say a lot of breeders use this method uh, when you cross B by B or R by R. Now, how do you make crosses to, um, to test for general combining ability? Let's start with the females. So you have a set of females that are new, that have been already sterilized. Okay, so you have your A and your B version for every line. How do you test them? For general combining ability, you're going to make crosses with just a few testers, one or maybe four. Testers are the male's lines in your program that are usually good, that are very advanced, then you, you know the way they perform in hybrid combinations, and those are the males that you're going to use first to cross to your female lines in what is called isolation plots. So the way that works is you're going to plant in a field a plot that are going to have all the female lines that you want to, to cross, to make crosses. Every row is going to be a different female, but it's always going to be the A version of the line. So they are sterile, OK? In that same plot, that are going to be full of those A lines. You put some lines that are going to be the male. This is going to be the R, your tester. It's called an isolation plot because what you're going to do is you're going to let them pollinate freely. But then it's important that you have no sorghum around so that no other pollen can come. So at least you need 800 meters with no other sorghum plot, no Johnson grass, nothing that can pollinate. And then you let it pollinate by wind. And then you come and you harvest your seed from every line. And then you plant those next year to test them in hybrid combinations. So that's an isolation plot. Now to test the same thing, the general combining ability, but of males, then you have to do it by hand. There's no other way. So what you do is you have a crossing block, and you have all your R lines, and you have a a lot of, of rows of your A lines that are going to be the tester. Again, there are lines that are advanced, very good in the program. You know the reaction. And what you're going to do is you're going to bring pollen from each line into here to a panicle of A. You bag it, and you identify it. Yes? I really can't see what's written on the Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe the lines? Is it better? Yeah. OK, I'm sorry. So what you do is you bring pollen from your R line, and you pollinate each panicle of the same A line, but you identify that panicle. You keep it separately. 
And then the next year, you're going to plant that seed into a hybrid combination, and that's going to be your A bar R hybrid. And that way, you test the general combining ability. You do that with only one to four different females. The same as, as here, you only use one to four males, just a few. But then when the lines are good enough and you want to advance them in the program, you test for the specific combining ability. And to do that, what you do is you cross all your males with all your females. So that's everything against everything in a crossing block. And you move the pollen manually. And you use your A lines with your R lines, new usually. So what you're looking for here in the specific combining ability is what compared to the general combining ability? What do you want to know here? Why are you interested in specific combinations of females and males? What's the difference between GCA and SCA? What kind of genetic effect are you looking for here? And what kind of genetic effect are you looking in the general combining ability? <clears throat> general is like additive, and specific is epistatic and dominant. It's additive and dominant, exactly. Which means that because you're interested in the additive and the dominance, you are really interested in that specific combination of male and female. Okay, whereas in the general combining ability, you're really interested in knowing how well that line performs in hybrid combination, but you're not interested probably in that particular combination, just in general, how good of a female is, or how good of a male is. That's why you only cross it just to a few. Okay. Is that more or less clear, how you organize the program, what the different parts are? Just briefly to touch on, um, I wanted to mention some of the traits that breeders um, might be interested in. This is just an example, by no means I'm trying to be broad here, but um, of course the number one trait is ill, it's always ill. Uh, some disease resistance, I, I I put some pictures here of diseases that might be kind of unique to sorghum uh, that you might not see easily in other species. For example, this is charcoal rot, which is a fungus that causes the stem, uh, destroys completely the stem so that plants lodge, and that's uh, a big loss. Long smut is a disease that is not very common in temperate climates. It's more common in, um, in Africa. Ergot is a disease uh, that is characterized by these honeydew type of secretions from the panicle. What happens is that um, when, the, uh, when the claviceps purpurea infects the, the flower, it just secretes those honeydew uh, sugary type of products with uh, the way to release the conidia and so that there's no grain produced, so the losses are complete. Um, there also. Some insect resistance. Green bark well, is something common to other species, but midge is something very unique to sorghum, and it's this, this fly that you see here. So the way it produces the damage is that the fly uh, lay eggs inside the flower. So when the egg hatches, the larvae uh, eats the ovary and destroys the, the growing seed, and so after that damage, you'll see a panicle like this, that it doesn't really have anything inside. And the way you know that it's midge is because you have these white type of structures, and that is the pupal case after the larvae, after the pupa hatch <coughs> or went away. It leaves this in the flower. That's the way you know it's the, it's the midge damage. Of course, it's controlled with the insecticides, but it's, um, it's difficult. Other traits like flowering time, of course, sometimes you want uh, materials that flower earlier or late, depending on your season, depending on your area. Drought tolerance, even though sorghum is naturally a very drought resistant crop, more and more people are interested in improving that trait. 
resistance to lodging, that's also very important. Striga resistance, um, striga is not important here, but uh, in other parts of the world it's a devastated parasitic weed that can destroy completely the, the crop. There is some level of resistance, even though it's been difficult to find it. Some morphological characteristics might be important. This is just to show you the variation that you can find in gray color. This is just an example. This, for example, represents what is called a yellow type of gray. This is a white. This is a red. And all of these are variations of what they are called brown uh, grain sorghums, which are called ver bird resistant because birds don't like to eat their grain because they have tannins. So the tannin make the grain very stringent. So if the bird try this grain, it's not going to eat it. So farmers that live in areas where birds are very a serious problem, they would prefer this type. The problem with this type of sorghums is that they are not very valuable in the market, um, and they are definitely not good for human consumption. So if you're talking about sorghums for human consumption, you prefer these two. And if you want to sell it for livestock, it's usually the red is the best. So depending on the, on the objective is um, the grain that you're going to look for. Brown midrib is, um, is also another characteristic that is um, this brown midrib is the way you identify it. It's considered to be a good characteristic because it has lower lignin content, um, so it has better digestibility. Particularly important for forage type of sorghums. And there are some future directions for um, sorghum breeder. Uh, particularly here, the ethanol production is coming to be a more and more important future trait. So the possibility to produce ethanol from sorghum plants, particularly sweet sorghums. There's also more emphasis on the food type of sorghums, which are the whites and the yellows that I show you because they are good for flour. Uh, the nutritional quality of the grain is also important. Uh, there's sorghum is included in the Harvest Plus uh, program to improve the nutritional quality for human consumption. Herbicide tolerance is an important trait in temperate climates because um, most of the herbicides that the kill grasses will kill the sorghum also. So it's very difficult to find a herbicide good for sorghum productions that will destroy uh, other grasses. Drought tolerance, uh, like I say. And you probably know that sorghum has been completely sequenced already. Unfortunately, it has not been aligned yet completely. Uh, so the, the genome sequence that has been released is just a draft. But that's going to make it a more important crop because the genome sequence is a very good resource. And it, it might also allow it to be used as a model crop for some, for some uh, traits. So that's mostly what I want to say. I, again, I want to emphasize that um, mostly everything I've said is for a temperate climb type of breeding program of sorghum. You go to African countries or to India, uh, hybrids are not very um, broadly used. They are still using land races and open pollinate varieties. They, they are very interested in very tall sorghums because they have other uses. So because I know this is being taped for, uh, for them, uh, I know this, that's a very different situation. But I just wanted to give you an idea of a breeding program that would be very different from others, um, like maize or, or other self pollinating crops. More questions or? Yes. Oh, Mexico has, uh, has hybrids. Um, Africa, I've talked to a few breeders there. Um, some of them, they are breeding for hybrids. One of the major constraints is not that the farmer is not interested, but they have the problem of seed distribution. Um, so in areas where they were able to solve that problem, they are more and more um, being distributed and used by farmers. But still the majority um, are not really hybrids. Okay, thank you.